Welcome to the Growth Enablement Madness podcast, and I'm Jim Ward, your host, CEO of BrainCell, the growth enablement company. I'm absolutely mad about helping businesses grow and scale. And in this podcast, my team and I get a chance to talk shop with industry thought leaders about a variety of growth enablement strategies, stories, and technology trends. I'm happy that you're here, so let's get the growth conversation started. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jim Ward, CEO of BrainCell, and we have a guest today who I have known for a little bit now. Uh, we did a water cooler series together, and uh, I was a big fan of uh, this author's, uh, I think it was your first book, Todd Capone. Is, by the way, Todd Capone is the guest, uh, author of The Transparency Sale. Uh, was that your first book, Todd? Yeah, and I think if you asked my English teacher in high school uh, that, oh, did you read Todd Capone's book? She'd probably be like, Todd Capone wrote a book. Like, that's insane. Oh. Yeah, that's my, my first and only, and surprisingly, it turned out pretty well. <laughs> Well, it's uh, you know, I want to talk about that in a second, but I also want to recognize uh, we have, we have also on the call today, which is Brian Anderson, who is our uh, our trusty um, uh, producer of this podcast, Growth Enablement Madness. Hi, Brian. I think I hit the record button, so I think we're good you to did. go. Yeah, we are good to go over there. Uh, and of course, our vice president of marketing, Sarah Reed. Hi, Jim. Hi, hey, Todd. Sarah. You know Hi, what Brian. I'm noticing, Sarah? You do not have your, you're not in your podcasting location. I'm not in my podcast studio today. You don't have your beautiful microphone. <laughs> I don't have my beautiful microphone. Mm. Now we got to do a lot of editing on the back end. Wow. We'll push through. Okay. But look at Todd's microphone. We're always looking at other people's microphones. It's kind of weird. But um, hey, Todd, so you know what? Level set with me before we get going. Um, the transparency sale, which I re-brought back to my desk. I keep it on my desk, actually, right in the back. I have a, a few books back there that I highlight. Um, can you just level set what the purpose of the book, what you, were, what you wanted folks to get out of it? Yeah, I mean, it, it really, it started in my last role. I was the chief revenue officer of a company called Power Reviews in Chicago. And we had discovered through some research with Northwestern University that when a website's acting as a salesperson, we all read reviews. We all read the negative reviews first. Mm -hmm. And when a product has an average review score between a 4.2 and a 4.5, that's actually optimal for purchase conversion, meaning a 4.2, like a product that's got negative reviews right under it, helps it sell more. And so me being the nerd that I am, I looked at the behavioral science of why and quickly discovered that that absolutely applies to B2B or human to human, that when we actually embrace what we're not great at, when we lead with our flaws and we present our solutions as Tyra Banks would call it, flossom, uh, which <laughs> to embrace our flaws, but know that we're still awesome, magic happens oh, in I our sales that. cycles. I started trying it. Magic really did start happening. Like sales cycles sped up, win rates went up. We were qualifying deals in and out faster. And I was like, I got to get these ideas out to the world. And it led to the book. And uh, here we are. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. And I, I, you're right. When you read reviews on a website and it's all five stars, uh, I am extremely suspicious. Right. So you want to see the somewhat of a balance. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Well, yeah. I mean, subconsciously, we know perfection's not a thing. And so right. for anybody listening, there's two things. Like, number one, there's a, actually a quote. I know we're going to talk a little sales history in a couple of minutes, but there's a quote yeah. from a guy named Arthur Dunn in 1919. The quote is, if the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. And like, I love that. Like, that's that's really where it starts. But it's this idea that Transparency sells better than perfection. And we have to do it now anyway because of the proliferation of reviews and feedback on everything we do, buy, and experience. And, and that's what it's all about. Every organization, every company in the world gives up something to be great at its core. And now is the time for everybody to go, all right, what are we giving up to be great at our core? And then how do we position that and lead with it so that our buyers know right out of the gate, hey, these people are not perfect. Here's what we would give up to be great in yep. I mean, I, on the B2C side, we talk so much about like Ikea, right? Which is, you got to find it. You got to write down the code because you're going to go to the warehouse and pick the 200 pound boxes off the of shelves onto a cart <laughs> that doesn't have brakes. You're going to roll that cart into the parking lot, jam it into the back of your car Tetris style, 
drive home with a souvenir injury or two, open the box and F-bomb your way through 150 <laughs> words that have no words on the work instructions, and then get a little endorphin rush because you've got modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for, and you go back to the store to buy the end tables that went with that bedroom set that you just F-bombed your way through. <laughs> the point being, Ikea, number one furniture retailer in the world for 13 straight years, and it sucks. <laughs> and, and that's but that's all of our companies the costco you know we can talk about costco all day long where you've got limited brands you have to get a membership if you want a toothbrush here here's a half dozen you want some ranch dressing here's a gallon right and right. Like, and as you check out there's going to be somebody out there that's going to look at your receipt to make sure you're not stealing something costco number two retailer in the uh the u.s behind walmart once again it Every one of our companies, if we start to embrace those things we give up to be great at our core, that's where the magic happens. And that's really kind of the core fundamental lesson that comes out of the book. So so a sales, I'm just going to do this quickly because I want to get to other things. But so if a salesperson is talking to their prospect in a B2B scenario, uh, what are you suggesting that they're they're doing to create, I guess, trust? Well, yeah, I mean, it's understanding from a pure clinical empathetic perspective we're at the same table together. What are you not gonna like and what are you gonna love? And if that thing you're not gonna like is really, really important, let's vet that now. Okay. And that's things like, you know, at Power Reviews, for example, we had our core solution. Our competitor had core solution, but had some add-ons, yep. right? And so the, the first time I had tried this was right after our competitor had released an add-on. And so when the customer asked me, hey, Todd, how are you better than your competitor? I and then instead switched it and said, hey, before we go there, can I share with how your, our competitor is better than us? They just released something that we don't have and oh. it's not even on our roadmap. If that's going to be important, can we vet that out now? And like magic happened, right? The, right. the, the disarming of being sold to went away and that sales cycle closed in 10 days versus what normally would be a six month process, right? And, and that's what we're looking at. From an empathetic perspective, we should understand our customers. We should be able to go, or go read the reviews on your own products. What's your customer gonna find when they read, if you're in the tech space, the G2s, the trust radiuses, yeah. even the glass doors, go to like, if it's Yelp or Google, whoever's listening to this, like go research like a customer would, embrace the negative things that your customer or your prospect's gonna find and curate your message into that four, two to four, five speak. And I'm telling you, magic will happen. And it's, mm -hmm. and as uh, Will Ferrell says in uh, Anchorman, it's science. Yeah, I think that is so powerful. You know what, Sarah, let's make sure everybody rereads the book. Yeah, we should. By well, tomorrow. Well, no, but even since, so you know this talk, cause I think I wrote you like a fan letter to, for the, and talked about the water cooler, but it was a book club book of ours. So we run a book club at brain cell and we introduced but since that it's been a book club book our sales team and our team overall has grown so we really should we really should mm -hmm. that wasn't a joke yeah i, I know i joke but then i'm not joking <laughs> no you should. it isn't a joke but uh so we, we've got a lot to get to and i'm uh i thank you for a level setting with us on the transparency it's an awesome book i keep it literally on my desk um so i do think that's a great idea we need to get everybody to reread uh it's very relevant so folks if you haven't read it please pick it up um wherever uh books are found if you listen to my audible or on audible it's on audible as well i think isn't it as well Todd? and it's me doing it so if you want and it's you sultry, doing it yeah if you want the sultry sounds of todd capone to lull you to <laughs> well, i think you've got a, a great folksy voice uh that remind that so that brings me to um you've got a new podcast that you're doing uh can you tell me a little bit about the name of the podcast and where it's found and i've been listening to it so uh tell me a little bit about it it's it's awesome that you bring that up i i am a nerd for sales history i it started i had a book from 1947 on sales and yep. um, I, I read it and i was like that's cool but it kept referencing other books so i kept going back i went back i got all the way to the 1890s um and i've got a collection now of you know 40 different books and magazines from the late 19th and early 20th century. And as I've been reading those, there are incredible stories. There's incredible tips. I, it's funny, a lot of what you see on LinkedIn today could have literally been in one of those books. I could probably right. take paragraphs from books from the early 1900s, plop them into LinkedIn, 
and put them out there as my advice and everybody would be like, yeah, awesome. And they would have no idea that it's 110 years old. But right. the, the podcast is just like me and a microphone and it's called the Sales History Podcast. And in it, I just tell some of the incredible stories I've found uh, from the past, like things like um, Mark Twain in doing what I believe could be the first like pure sales enablement uh, plan. It, it's mm -hmm. amazing what he did for Ulysses S. Grant. That story is amazing. I found, you know, powerful women in sales who have pioneered the profession for women mm -hmm. that you can't find anywhere. And I've found in just bits and pieces and been able to put together a great story there. Uh, colleges and high schools teaching sales back in the early 20th century. Uh, the next episode is going to be on some of the crazy stuff that I found, uh, which is like um, physiognomy and phrenology, for example, which is I, I changed my approach to selling based on the shape of your head, um, <laughs> certain things like that. Uh, and so and, and that was such a profound sales philosophy that the person that pioneered it, a guy named Grant Noblo, was speaking like he was a, a headline keynote at sales conferences back then. Not the witch trials out of Salem. He wasn't in that. Uh, uh, no, I don't believe he was okay. in that. Okay. Uh, but he probably, I mean, some of these books are insane. But like the Ford Motor Company, it was their methodology in the 1920s. With Interesting. Physiognomy and phrenology, which is altering your approach based on the shape of somebody's head and forehead. So I, I really found it, uh, you're all going to find it very uh, interesting to listen to the podcast. A, it's very short. So eight minutes, 12 minutes in around those are short. They're, it's very folksy. It's got some great music that gives you a, it's warming. Your voice is very uh, folksy, so you have that. Um, I was noticing uh, with Lucinda Prince, I think her name was, uh, where I think some of her work is in Simmons College here in Boston. Um, but and also I noticed that, um, and this is I don't mean this at all. I, I think it was funny because a lot of folks have trouble with our Boston uh, uh, city names, and one of them was I think you said Wellesley. I might have, yeah. I think that did, did I completely screw that one up. It's Wellesley, just so you know. But it's Wellesley is something that people do. They do this all the time. I'm going to give you one. Well, yes. I, I, this is going to be a hard one. So you're going to have to write it down as I give it to you, and I want you to repeat it back to me. Tell me what it says. P E A B O D Y. Isn't that just Peabody? Peabody. Peabody. No. Peabody. Way. Yeah. yeah. That so. was actually one of the easier ones, I would argue. Oh, really? What would you give yeah. him? Um, oh, gosh. Now I'm going to have to spell <laughs> <laughs> W O R C H E S T E R. That's a good one. I'm going to, I, well, my answer would be Worcester, but that's clearly wrong. So it's, oh. Worcester. Worcester. We have so many of these that everybody gets them wrong. So I did, it came out to me when I heard Wellesley. I thought, oh, that's how people always say it. <laughs> there was one other location that I think you may have mentioned. It was uh, interesting. But in the Mark Twain story, um, a question for you that came up in my mind was uh, when Ulysses S. Grant was originally going to go with the um, other publisher, which was going to take much more than Twain did, um, you, you talked that he was a very loyal guy. And uh, But what? why did he not go with it at the end? Because you kind of – I think that Mark Twain really was a strong salesperson. I see. Uh, I, I've not gotten to the core as to why he finally went against it, but I think uh, Mark Twain just put together such a great pitch for why Ulysses S. Grant should partner with Twain on this book that he finally gave in. And I think the, the fact that Ulysses S. Grant was given that death sentence uh, around the incurable cancer probably pushed mm. it a little bit faster. Yeah, it, it's a guys. I really am going to tell you. You need to listen to it because it's a fun. Listen, uh, what's old is new. You're going to find out. Um, you know when you look at how people have recurated information, like um, uh, who's uh, uh, what's the fellow's name that came up with? Um, uh, oh, one of your you talked about him. Um, he is um, famous for sales, Carnegie. Oh, Dale yeah. Carnegie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, really, he kind of recurated stuff that already existed, right? So repackaged. Yeah, um, yeah I find it fascinating, uh, all of it. So good job on Thank that. You. Good job on that. Um, but, and just one other thing, Ulysses S. Grant was penniless 
for those who, uh, and he got involved with a fellow named Ward. <laughs> Ward. Uh, Fernando, was it Fernando Ward? Uncle Fernando. <laughs> who uh, had a Ponzi scheme mm -hmm. yeah. and left him penniless. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So he penniless and dying. And then you, uh, yeah, I don't want to give away the podcast. So just go listen to this because it's a lot of fun and it's quick, entertaining. All right. So, um, you know, uh, Todd, we've been through this uh, thing called a pandemic. Um, uh, you know, as horrible as it is and tragic and lives lost, it's also a tremendous learning experience. Um, I think a lot of things have shifted as a result. I find that interesting to sort of uh, look at what the past 16 months um, we experience and how things have changed. Uh, so um, how has, in your opinion, business leadership changed over the last 16 months through that pandemic? Well, it's a case study in behavioral science. It's really, for a nerd like me, it has been absolutely fascinating to watch what I understand and know about the behavioral science of what I call intrinsic inspiration, which means at its core, like if you think that salespeople are coin operated, they are if you're doing it wrong, uh, that there are certain elements that contribute to why your salespeople show up every day. They do their best, they stay and they advocate on your behalf. And so if you look at those elements and then you look at, all right, let's go back to March of 2020 before the pandemic and how sales leaders manage to that. And then all of a sudden it hits and everybody's got to go home. There's a couple of things that happened at first when everybody went home, you know, first of all, uh, sales leaders, one of their intrinsic uh, elements, the things that drives them is certainty and predictability. Mm -hmm. but it's also the reps driver too, is certainty and predictability. We pulled both of those away. So what did sales reps do? They were like, this is great. I get to be home, um, I, but I can't predict the future. So now I'm nervous. But what do the managers do? They overcompensated on certainty and predictability by doing daily check-ins. Like, I can't see you, so we need to talk every day and you need to tell me about what you're doing and what the highlight of your day is. We're gonna get everybody. So we started there. We did that for about two or three months and mm -hmm. reps felt like they had to go take a shower at the end of the day. <laughs> the managers were all over yeah, them. Right. And managers started to realize, all right, we gotta ease back on that. So we went to the next piece, which was, reps and people feeling like they're all alone and they're not feeling like anybody has their back and their connections have disappeared. So what did we do? We overcompensated there. So we started doing virtual happy hours, which at the time were great, right? And like, hey, Jim, how are you doing? How's your fam? Oh, is that your cat? Like we, we did a lot of that for a while, which again, very necessary. We need to connect, create that yeah. familial bond. Right. But I think when we look at where we are now, we're still stuck on that one. And we've under we've overcompensated on family and connection. And we've undercompensated on what I call function, mission and purpose. Uh, and as a result, what you're seeing now is due to the fact that there is very little physical cost to change jobs, meaning yeah. I don't have to I don't have to change my commute. I still come right here. All I do is get a new laptop. Yay for me. So very little physical cost to change jobs. And then the emotional cost is not there. If I've never met you, it becomes so much easier for me to leave you. And as a result, any little trigger is causing people to change jobs. And we're seeing it in um, the US Department of Bureau and Labor Statistics, and I'm sure I butchered that, just uh, issued data that said that in April, 4 million people changed jobs. And that is the highest on their record. And we're going to continue to see it. And I believe it's behavioral. It's that element of lack of physical, lack of emotional cost. Mm. And as a result, the triggers to change are so limited. And hey, the virtual happy hour is great, but they will never replicate personal, like familial type of security. Yeah. And man, you could send the logoed socks and all that all day long too. That that really doesn't help. So that that's kind of like the, the timeline over the last six months of what I've seen. You may have noticed my face shift into complete paranoia. 
now because I know, uh, I'm like, oh geez, Todd. Oh no, my god, no. we just we've been hiring people we've never met at this point, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Well, the upside was, uh, I think of this as I became less concerned about people having to be in an office environment and being around, and therefore that lifted the um, the ability for me to hire in multi states. Uh, which creates other problems too, by the way. Um, right. But um, and so some people we have not met yet. We're going to fly them in, of course. But uh, so that that creates um, what you're saying, which creates the paranoia for me, is the risk of folks being able to leave and the headspace it takes to be able to hire somebody. Uh, we're a mid-sized company, so it takes a lot of headspace, particularly when you have a process of hiring. Um, so I guess this mission, purpose, environment that you speak of, how do, how do you create it? How do you how do you uh, make it a, a shift in business, a mind shift, so that we can reduce this risk? Well, yeah, I mean, if you just think about, there's nothing unique about virtual happy hours and logo socks, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing unique about uh, hybrid versus virtual versus in the office. There's nothing unique about uh, management style, like all of that. But what is unique to you and your company is what is your mission? What is your purpose? How does the individual sales rep or you know Sarah in marketing or whoever, um, do, do those individuals know what their work means to you as an individual, as a leader? Do they know what their work means to the company? Do they know what their work means to your customers? Do they know what their work means to your customer's customer? You got to make sure they know that their work in a unique way creates an impact to individuals and miss like again we do charity work all day long we don't do it for the money we don't do it for anything other than mission purpose impact that we're making a, a difference for people in their lives hmm. all of our companies all like i'll give you one cheesy example there was a medical device company they they had people that all day long all they did was put together like a you know, assemble parts for medical devices. So they would like, oh, here's a nut, um, here's a screw, I'm gonna put it on here. That's all they did eight hours a day. Mm. Almost no turnover. You know why? Because every couple of weeks, they would bring somebody in who's wearing a medical device that they assemble. And those uh. people would get up and say, hey, listen, if you didn't do that right, I wouldn't be here right now. And they, they would go, oh, cry. And then all of a sudden their kids would run in. I'm like, I wouldn't have a mommy or daddy. And like these people, they would immediately go to, when's this lunch and learn going to be over so I can go stack those screws again? It's, it's like, you know, but that's that's what I'm talking about. In the, the SaaS environment, the, like you, you've got, you're making an impact on customers and their customers with the work you're doing. Like I was CRO of Power Reviews. We sold technology that helped retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. So what? Well, the so what is we're helping those consumers make much smarter decisions with their money and not make mistakes and not get themselves in trouble. Uh, like we're making an impact on helping people make better decisions in their personal lives with their hard earned money. Right. We make sure that all of our reps know that because that becomes unique and everybody like. And so I, I encourage everybody who's listening, if you're in a leadership role of any type to find your mission, find your purpose, understand what your work and your individual reps or whoever works for you's work means to your customers and your customers' customers. And if you don't know, go ask them. So that's interesting, too, because, you know, over the last three years, we were evolving from, uh, you know, really reselling software and services, et cetera, to um, what I would consider much more noble purpose. And that is to we, we don't sell that anymore. We sell outcomes. And what we want to do is have our clients receive an outcome. So when we talk about pipeline, it's a different conversation, um, particularly on an opportunity. We're going to talk about, well, what's the value they're going to receive out of this? How are they going to grow or scale their business? Um, do, do you think that aligns with this mission purpose environment? Uh, yeah. So are we on the right track, in other words? Exactly. I mean, if you uh, create a mission and purpose based on outcomes, but make sure that that outcome goes all the way to your customer's customer too. Right. What are those outcomes that they're looking to achieve yeah. that you create and deliver in a unique way? Because again, you're not gonna be able to differentiate on that other stuff, but what you do differentiate is on the impact that you and what your work does on a minute, minute by minute, day by day, week by week basis means right. to the end consumer. Yeah, uh, so that, uh, that's that been very helpful for us, this whole shift. So 
Do you have some examples of companies that are struggling with this? And, uh, you know, what have they been doing to overcome it? Well, I think there are many are uh, many have gotten into this mode of the virtual happy hours and the overcomp like I even see on LinkedIn people are so proud of hey come to our company and look at first day employees are getting these like this logoed coffee cup or whatever like oh good for you <laughs> right I mean like I still see that so much I, I just think that you know most organizations need to really look inward and to start to discover what impact the work because here's the thing and from a sales leadership perspective mm. I ask, like, I, I taught a group of sales leadership uh, leaders a, a couple of months ago. I'm doing another class tomorrow morning for just a group of sales leaders. And the question that I ask in prep is, hey, tell me about your one on ones with your reps. Like, wh what are you focused on? And uh, it's like, oh, the forecast. OK, uh, yeah. what else? Uh, no, we, we go through, we do deal strategy and OK. So you're creating the impression for your sellers that they're a number with a number. Right. And it's just plug and play and they can go anywhere. And the minute that they miss their uh, that their quota goes up, their territory gets a little smaller. They lose a deal. They don't like the look of their forecast or their buddy that they just had drinks with over the holiday um, is making a ton of money somewhere else where they're hiring. That's the minute they leave. So I, I think, right. you know, step one is you've got to get beyond the forecast in your one on ones like mm -hmm. yesterday. And then number two is to like, again, talk to your customer when your customer if you're in a SaaS space or something where you've got customers that keep coming back find the ones that you've got good relationships with that just renewed and ask them why like hey why did you renew and, yeah. and pick at it and figure out like hey, what does it mean to you personally tell mm. me about your customers like what impact are your solutions making on your customers and start to vet that and pull it together to curate so that during your your team meetings your all hands meetings as a company share those things have customers come in and talk yeah. like that it's a great thing about doing these podcasts i learned so much and i can see sarah writing notes you're running that note aren't you i hope because it is about the impact down the line i do have one question though yeah. um so sales leaders are talking to their sales reps they're asking questions about forecasts what's a example of a question they should be asking well, I think they should be having the discussion about making sure that those reps understand what their work means to them as individuals, yeah. what it means to the customers and what it means to the customers, customers and how you do that. I, I can't give you the words for it because it's got to probably come right. from the heart. Yep. Um, but mm. it's it's I, I think it starts with um, like at Power Review is one of the things my CEO did really well is during all hands meetings, we would have customers talk about the impact that what the the team is doing has on their organization. Um, I don't know if we did a good job of getting down to their customers customer level, but right. but there's an opportunity there yeah. and it starts there and then it leads to the individual one on one type discussions about uh, understanding because again, it, it helps sellers sell too when they know what they're selling has an impact on the customer and the customers customers. So that's that's the kind of discussion that you can have during a one on one, even at a deal level. But like, right. hey, what is this solution going to mean to the individual that you're selling to? Mm -hmm. What's it going to mean to their customers? And let, let's understand that so that your work matters. But let's also understand it to help you sell more. That, that is uh, actually that is so impactful when you think about it and bringing somebody to a sales meeting who can tell that story, which further reinforces this mission uh, purposed environment. And folks are really getting a feel for it. I, we're going to do that. That's happening. Um, Hmm. It's funny how that. It's funny how more impactful that is in comparison to what you're hearing, like everybody talking about in the business world today, in terms of like news and trends. Like Todd, I bet you're like hearing a lot about what's going on in Iceland with their trials for the four day work week and all that. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure a four day work week would be great, but even still, like it, you can isn't, only, that what, isn't that you, what I'm on, Brian? Well, you you can do whatever <laughs> yeah. you want. And then, yeah, there's, that's it. That's it. I'm sorry, I, I ruined your train of thought. You know, to your point, though, Brian, I mean, that's that's an issue that I also saw pre pandemic, um, like pandemic aside, uh, the, the, there's something that I did not make up this term. I don't remember the guy that did, but he calls it perk inflation, uh, which is, hey, if you want to recruit people and get the hold on, we've got to win the perk battle, which is, uh, you know, it starts with 
hey, let's have some uh, cold brew and some beer on tap at all times. Let's give three square meals of food in the kitchen area all the time. Let's get a ping pong table and a papa shot. Let's uh, have like, you know, and all of a sudden you just keep winning. Like you're trying to win the war of perks and mm. you will never win. Cause like what's gonna happen when we go to four day work weeks? Well, let's fast forward about 10 years. Some company's going to be like, hey, let's do a three day work week. We're going to win, right? And then, like, the next thing you know, like, <laughs> hey, gonna... we're going to employ people to work an hour a day. I mean, you can't win the perk infl- inflation battle. And, and I see companies and I see news headlines like that. Sure, that's going to be great. But the company, like your competitor that's still working five days a week with mission, with purpose, with impact, they're going to kick your butt, right? Like, so you just, you got to be careful with the perks. You're going to win on those other categories, not on trying to one-up somebody about how cool you are. That just reminds me. Hold on one second. Victoria, cancel the pool table. <laughs> we're not going to win on that one, okay? Oh, man. I know you were looking forward to it, Brian, but yeah, was, it's over. I was, I was but waiting you know, for something. I know. But you know what? Um, before you move on, it makes me think that this mission purpose uh, environment needs – to have folks that you're hiring that share those core values. And so I think it's important when you uh, hire folks that you do understand and they understand what your core values are so that you're in alignment as best as you can, because then it would be hard to be uh, mission-based, I think. But um, anyway, that's an aside. Um, As we're squeezing in time here, I want to make sure we get to, uh, are you working on another book? That's what I'm most interested in right now. Yeah, because like you can hear this whole conversation. Most of it has been talking about sales leadership. Yeah. And what I quickly discovered, there's two things. Number one, when I first got thrust into sales leadership, um, I, it was a, it's a long story. The short version is my CEO fired our head of sales and was like, Todd, we think you're ready. And I'm like, OK. I'm like, I had no structure. <laughs> I had no framework. We, I've learned sales process my whole career, but there's never mm-hmm. really a leadership process. And so I created one um, and I used it. It's called the five F's of building revenue capacity is, is the structure the, the book is called the transparent sales leader, mm-hmm. um, but it's taking structure and a framework and applying the principles of transparency to it. And of course, behavioral science to become you know, the, the maximum uh, sales leader that you possibly can. So the book okay. is really about combining those things like science and structure and sincerity into a structure or framework that whether you're a new leader uh, moving into your first leadership role or you've been doing this for 30 years, you can take those elements together and be the best you and then crush your uh, crush your peers from a sales leadership perspective, especially. Yep. I'll, I'll give you like one little example. That hmm. structure I used when I got to Power Reviews, my CEO had interviewed 13 people for the CRO role. I came in, I was number 13. I, he asked me, hey, how would you approach your role? Like what would those first 30 to 60 uh, days look like? And I laid out those five Fs. And uh, he was, at the end of the interview, he was like, hired. Like it, it, literally, cause nobody's got a structure or a framework. So why do we have a sales process, but not a sales leadership process? And that's what I'm trying to bring again, all entrenched in behavioral science and transparency. So, you know, uh, and I mean this, I'm not blowing smoke uh, upward and shouldn't go, um, <laughs> but I think you take on angles that nobody else takes on uh, in, from the sales world, and I, I love that stuff. Um, what, when will that book be out? Is it out yet? No, I'm still writing it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I am right in the midst of it. I, I just printed off. Uh, where I am, I'm about twenty thousand words in, but my I owe my publisher a little over forty thousand in a month. Okay, so I got a lot of work to do. Um, but manuscript in August, we go through that whole process. Book is uh, expected to be out uh, late February of 2022, but it's already listed on Amazon, which is weird. I haven't even finished it. Oh, I wonder if it's a pre-order. You can pre-order right now. Well, and I haven't even finished the dark. We thing. will pre-order because it uh, it's funny. Our uh, our president of our company has taken over uh, running the complete functional area of sales, which was a duty that I I used to run, um, probably not very well. Uh, I think she's going to do much better, much more detail. Got to get that book. Um, yeah, no, the the angles you take are really really helpful. They're impactful. So for those of you who haven't read uh, Todd Capone's. Uh, the transparency sale, please do that because the sequel, it sounds like, and it sounds like a sequel. Is it fair to say it's kind of a sequel? And- well, it's going to incorporate the, the 
science of the first one and apply it to leadership. To leadership. Yep. From a, a sequel perspective, the cover will look exactly the same, except it's going to be a really cool color purple. But it'll have the hardcover still will have the transparent acetate cover on it. Oh, I love that. And, and again, what's the title? Uh, the Transparent Sales Leader. The Transparent Sales Leader. Love it. So, folks, look for that. Uh, Pre-order it on Amazon. Uh, we're going to do the same. Um, this brings us to a, our segment called our Techtainment section, where we get to ask you some questions that you have not been scripted. You have no idea what they are. So, um, if you don't mind, I yeah, it's probably a good idea. You should be sweating. Um, no, these are fun. So, uh, if I were to ask you, which TV sitcom would you star in? That you'd like to star in, wow. past, past, present, can't be future because we don't know what's coming up. Oh man, I, uh, you know, I, just a show like Seinfeld oh, continues right to be a classic because right it's on. so, it's so counterintuitively brainy too. Yes, like, you know, like I take concepts of like the soup Nazi episode, for example, about yep. like how do you take those and apply it to expectation setting? Like that guy's a jerk. <laughs> Yet the line is still down the, the hall, right. like down the street. But from a sales perspective, it's brilliant, right? And yeah. so, like, but I would, I would have so much fun and kind of like counterintuitive nature of a show that really has no plot. I, I love it. A show about nothing. I yeah. love it. Is right. Yeah. <laughs> soup Nazi. No soup for you. Exactly. <laughs> Who's got the next one? Um, okay, so let's talk superpowers. And I'm so sorry, I have someone out here weed whacking. Um, but if you had to pick between these two superpowers, which one would you pick? And it's invisibility or mind reading, reading people's minds. Oh, man. I, so I'm going to go with the process of elimination because I don't want to be able to read mine. <laughs> like, honestly, like that, that, that just sounds horrible to me. I don't want to know what people think. Um, so I would have to go with invisibility. I don't know what I would do with it, but uh, I definitely do not want to be able to read people's minds. That would... That would scare me. Yeah, it's like one of those things that's like depends on the context. It's like if I'm able to like choose whose minds I can read, uh -huh. that that'd be awesome. But yeah. then if I can't control it, then it's like that's terrible. That's like a, <laughs> that's like a curse. Exactly. <laughs> I'm still thinking which one I want. I'm gonna, yeah, I think I'd go with invisibility. Yeah. 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 Uh, hey, like, Brian, you got one? As long as invisibility is yeah. not used to be like a creep. Uh, well, that's that's yes. well. That all comes. Well, Todd, comes thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Todd. That was uh, I thought that was obvious, but I don't know. I maybe some don't. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, moving right along. <laughs> so, right. I am sweating. <laughs> Todd, last one. So, what is the craziest, most daring thing you've ever done? I can't answer that. Oh, well, you were invisible. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I've done some stupid things. I was not the, always the, uh, the the shining star A-plus uh, student, in, especially in college. I, I, I did get thrown in the drunk tank at, in school once for something oh. stupid. But uh, I, I actually got thrown in twice. The second one, I won't tell you about the first one, though. I was, uh, we were stealing street signs. And so um, I was up on top of the sign trying to take it down as the police came over the hill. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Wait, who, me? So yeah. I, I, I've done some crazy stuff. Um, I, I've had a couple of really cool experiences. Uh, I did get to go fly out uh, and spend a weekend on an aircraft carrier in the Atlantic. Ooh, that'd be awesome. So that's not like a crazy thing that I did, but um, we, we flew out, we landed on the aircraft carrier, and then we got catapulted off after a couple of days. Did you sleep <laughs> on board? I, I, attempt, I attempted to, but the room they had us in was right under the catapult, and they were doing night uh, missions or night flights yeah. all night. So me and the, the guys I was with, we literally maybe slept 20 minutes. It was impossible wow. because that thing is so loud. Yeah, yeah. And do you feel any rock and roll of the seas on such a large carrier? Um, uh, Maybe a tiny bit. Like, I think I felt it more when I got off of it. Yeah, um, okay. And I'll tell you, getting catapulted, I, I don't know if any of Oh, yeah, no, I've never been catapulted. Well, it, that, that my was, wife tried to catapult me once out of the house. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they put you, we catapulted on a supply plane. Um, mm. And so you're facing backwards. You have to close your eyes because the G-forces are so high. They, they tell you, close your eyes, put your arms on, or on your shoulders because your eyeballs will feel like they want to leave the sockets. And sure enough, it, it was insane. Like that was wow. one of the craziest experience. And that was... 
September 11th, 2000. So a year to the day before our September. Yeah, wow. So I, I can't imagine what it would have been like if it was a year later. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Well, listen, I want you to, could you tell everybody uh, a little bit about what you're offering? You have workshops and I know you have your published book uh, or maybe it's books. Um, tell me, what are you doing these days and how are you helping companies? Yeah. And so I, um, my business is really focused on speaking and doing workshops. Okay. And so um, I think, you know, as people are starting to plan their sales kickoffs, if they need somebody, I, this, I love doing that. Uh, but I teach all concepts around transparency as it relates to sales, sales leadership. Mm. Most popular thing that I teach is called transparent negotiating. You'll see Ooh. it in the book, but yep. I, um, I teach that an awful lot. And it's a counterintuitive approach to the way that you negotiate so that you're not eroding trust to the goal line. You're not giving away dollars in the form of charity to the customer's bottom line. And instead, you're getting value for every dollar you give away in the form of a discount and your deals become more predictable. And so workshops virtual and in person and then a lot of speaking how do they get a hold of you you can find me anywhere i'm almost annoyingly uh but uh, my website you can go to toddcaponi.com transparency sales dot or i'm sorry transparency sale.com or find me on linkedin and connect with me that way and it's todd with two d's right. caponi yeah. c-a-p-o-n-i exactly got yeah, it not okay to be confused with al capone right which I, at first, I was completely confused. I thought you know, there was a lineage. Uh, but I want to thank you. You know, um, you bring tremendous value, Todd. I mean that. And uh, the books, the things you speak about, any company would be lucky to have you. Uh, so we want to thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks to Sarah and Brian for all their hard work supporting this podcast. Um, this is Jim Ward. I'm CEO of BrainCell. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Growth Enablement Madness Podcast. I also want to thank Divinio Podcast for this episode's production and distribution. Finally, thank you to Sam Ward for our musical introduction and outro. Be sure to check out all of our episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. New episodes are available monthly and cover all important topics for growing and scaling your business. Until next time, this is Jim Ward signing off. Let's grow. Wow.